Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. We understand this has probably been a pretty long day, and we are the last thing in between you and dinner and drinks. So we will make this short, sweet, and hopefully jam-packed full of really interesting information. Um, we're excited about this. Uh, Tim and I have been working with uh, the Fido Alliance, with our friends at Apple and Google, and with a lot of other industry partners over the last few years to make Passkey a reality. And uh, we've been getting a lot of buzz lately over the last, uh, last couple of weeks. Hopefully you've seen that. Um, authentication today has a lot of really big problems, and Passkey has a lot of really big solutions. So we're excited to share that with you today. Uh, this is meant to be very high, uh, high overview, get you really excited for the other Passkey sessions and uh, Fido sessions later this week. Um, I am Scott Bingham. I'm a program manager, recently changed to product manager at Microsoft. Uh, I primarily drive uh, innovation and adoption of consumer passwordless methods. And I'm Tim Capali. I'm a standards architect, and one of the areas I look after is strong authentication. So a quick agenda. Uh, today we're going to be talking about what a passkey is, uh, how it works, and why it's great. Uh, we're going to look at a security spectrum, where it fits on all the options that are available today. Uh, we're going to walk through some user experience and also talk a little bit about high value consumer and enterprise scenarios and where passkey uh, makes sense there. So what is a passkey? And to really understand what a passkey is and the implications, the impact, and the value proposition that it offers, we have to take a step back and look at some of the underlying uh, challenges in the authentication space today. So back at the dawn of computing, we needed a way to protect our digital information. And we came up with this concept called a password, right? A piece of public information, your username, and a piece of supposed to be private information, your password. But that didn't work very well. We have it today, and it still doesn't work very well. And so we, you know, we're thinking, what else can we do? And so FIDO came out, and FIDO was born, and offered uh, asymmetric key pair cryptography. Fantastic security. But it also had some, some drawbacks um, that prevented adoption at a global billions with a B scale. So let's walk through a couple of those challenges. The first is that roaming authenticators, security keys, for example, are required to bootstrap the platform. And those roaming authenticators cost money. We found that consumers aren't always interested in buying those security keys. Sometimes that price point is just a little too high for them and it doesn't, doesn't make sense. We also found that consumers are not always interested in carrying around another discrete device to authenticate. Something else to lose, something else that is uh, difficult to replace. Device loss is also another huge issue. That if that security key and that credential on that security key is your sole means of accessing your, uh, your site, your service, your app, and you lose that, you're kind of out of luck. And the solution up to this point was, well, get another security key as a backup if you want to maintain that high bar of security, key, of security. But that brings in some challenges of cost and, again, losing another thing or trying to protect another thing. And an, an alternate fallback is you know, use a password and some sort of uh, OTP. But that kind of undermines the entire uh, principle here of the security that you get. The security is inherent with uh, your security keys. We also found that the terms web authen and security key is confusing for users. They just aren't really super intuitive terms. We did some research and found that you know, given a, a site that offers web authen and a username and password, users are going to type in their username and password, what they've been doing for years. Their username, they're going to query a password and they're not going to think twice about it. They see the term security key or web authen, and that sounds really cool and fancy, but probably not for me, so they're going to avoid it. So we're in this interesting position now. We have, on one hand, uh, passwords and all the inherent weaknesses with those. Um, they're bad, but people have been using them for a long time. On the other hand, we have the ultra security offered by FIDO, but know that that kind of um, it has some really good application in enterprise um, for security con conscious individuals, um, high value consumers, but does have some limitations. And so we went to the proverbial whiteboard. We said, if we're going to solve authentication for billions of users, and if we started from scratch, what would it look like? And so we came up with a few points. The first is that it has to be as easy to use as a password. No matter the level of security that we offer with any type of new offering, it's got to be as easy to use as a password. If it's not, people are not going to use it. And we have some, that's a really high bar. One, because people use bad passwords. Like I said, they can QWERTY something. 
Two, because we have password managers and autofill that make this even easier today. And remember my password, so that's a very high bar. The next is it has to be easy for users to recognize and understand. It's got to be as easy as tapping a big red button or turning a door handle uh, to authenticate. Um, if it's harder than what they're already doing today, it's not going to work. The next is it has to leverage a user's existing device investments. We can't go and require the world to go buy um, discrete uh, technology to, to authenticate. Finally, it has to be durable across device loss. Today, you have your phone and you sign into all your websites, apps, and services with the username and password and you drop that phone in the ocean, you can get another phone and sign into all your apps and services and websites with the username and password. And if that's not true with our new solution, it's not going to work. Finally, we need to be geo-aware and inclusive. This has to work for everybody on the planet. It's got to work no matter what device you're using, um, where, where you might live, um, marketplace you're in, uh, what language you speak. Uh, it's got to work everywhere. And finally, it's got to work, work cross-platform, meaning, like I said, if you're on an Apple device, a Microsoft device, a Google device, no matter what operating system you're on or, or platform, uh, it, it's got to work because the password works. So we came up with this concept called a passkey. And a passkey is a password replacement that is safer, easier, and faster to use. And you'll notice very intentionally that passkey is a lowercase p. It's a passkey like a password. You use it in the same way. It's not an uppercase p. It's not a branded term. The term is not owned by any one entity or body. Okay, we can use it just like the way we say password. And there's a couple things that make this really exciting. I'm going to go through those. The first is a passkey under the covers, under the hood, is a web authoring credential. It's the same type of credential that's stored on a security key. What makes this really exciting, though, is that you don't need dedicated hardware to do this. You can use the devices that you already have. So our devices today have built-in facial scanning. They have built-in fingerprint reading. They have device pin. And so you can use a passkey with those devices that you already have. The other really exciting thing about this is that the private key is part of the public and private key pair that um, WebAuthn offers can be synced through a consumer cloud to other devices on that same platform. For example, if I have an Apple device and I use it to sign into my, or I, use, I create a passkey for an app, I can immediately go to my iPad, pick up my iPad, and use my, my Touch ID or my Face ID to, say, to sign in. I go and buy a MacBook, I sign in with my iCloud account, and all my passkeys are immediately there. So we've solved this problem where you don't have to reprovision a credential with every device. We've solved the problem of device upgrade and device loss. The other really exciting thing about this is, like I mentioned earlier, it works cross-platform. So I can use an Apple device to sign into my Microsoft computer, or I can, or Google, and back and forth, and up and down, and sideways. That it works no matter the devices you have, which is a super compelling point, given the older operating systems, the older platforms, older devices that are already in existence, this is going to work, with no extra apps to download. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Um, so now we're going to dig into, yep, we, we went through kind of the high level. Now let's dig into kind of the components that make all this work and also a quick look at the security spectrum, right? You, I think, we, you know, one of the top things that comes up during this is where does this fit on kind of an existing uh, security timeline or, or, or a spectrum. So let's take a quick look, right? Where we're at today or prior to kind of this, this past key idea is that everyone kind of had the idea of a password. And over on the right-hand side, you were told, okay, do this FIDO thing and you will, you know, have this awesome strong security. And so that's on a, a security key, or it could be in a TPM, in a hardware-bound man manner. You'll notice here we're saying single device passkey. These are terms we're using with technical audiences. We don't expect users to understand single device, multi-device, but it's important for these discussions to understand that. Um, so anyone who was still rolling out passwords and their users didn't want to deploy passkeys, uh, multi-device credentials, security keys, whatever, I'm sorry. Ugh. Security keys, I threw myself off by explaining that. Um, for, the, for the organization that didn't want to deploy security keys, whether it was a help desk burden or back to a lot of the points that Scott highlighted, um, people were told, okay, add OTP, some form of OTP, because that will prevent phishing, right? Most of the concerns with authentication is around phishing, right? So people rolled out OTP, whether it was via an email magic link, SMS, OTP app, right? That was what folks were told, and that's what people have been doing for years. Does anyone like that experience? Okay. Oh, Libby. She doesn't work for Microsoft, no. I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so then uh, we get into this uh, multi-device credential or passkey world. And so if you call a password one and a single device passkey or a hardware security key, a 100, we think that this multi-device credential fits right in the middle. It is better than a password. It's phishing resistant. 
but it does not replace security keys for high security customers, right? And that's an important detail. And so after we kind of thought about that, we came up with this, this, this term, this concept, we started looking at what it would take to implement that. We thought, okay, is there something we can do for kind of this 75, right, between a multi-device passkey or a passkey and a hardware security key? And so we're not gonna go too deep into it here, but we, we are proposing as part of this initiative something called a device public key that would allow you to have some level of device context that would provide a little bit more um, awareness of that this, let's say this passkey is coming from a new device, right? So you can think of it as kind of the remember me, keep me signed in model, being able to know that the 17th time this user came into my site, they're coming from the same device. So let's jump into user experience real quick. We'll come back to the DPK in a second, but. Um, one of the requirements was a good UX and as easy to use as a password. So one of the things that's coming out of this, one of these features to, to really uh, make this experience a reality is, is this idea of like hinting to the user that they actually have passkeys available on the platform, right? If you're familiar with social sign-in or federated third-party sign-in, one of the challenges users have is they don't realize they signed up with Google and then they click sign up with, sign in with Apple, right? And they have two accounts now. We hope that this will help solve that because the platform itself will actually offer up a list in the browser or in the app to say you actually already have a passkey for this app or site. Right? So all the user has to do is touch that and away they go. It's a familiar experience for users. Almost every password manager on the market operates this way. It is dynamic, right? So if I have multiple credentials, right? If you, if you, have, um, if you use like Azure AD as an example, many people have multiple accounts. Um, it's dynamic and it will, you know, there's nothing Nothing a relying party or a website needs to do to, to, to um, populate this with additional accounts, right? That's just something that's provided by the platform. It is privacy preserving. Uh, the, first, the first mention we got um, when we started showing this was like, oh my God, the RP can know all the accounts I have. This is rendered by the browser or the app and nothing gets sent to the relying party until the user clicks on it and then does their biometric, right? So this is all rendered under the covers um, to assist the user. And the last one is it's a simple change for relying parties. You just add a little tag to your autocomplete field on username, and if you want to add some additional logic to check if this feature is available, you can, completely optional. But we, am, we would like to get to a world where this username first kind of field, which many RPs have already adopted, is kind of the way forward. Because if you were able to detect this feature is available, um, and let's say the feature wasn't available, you could dynamically render the password field. But let's start getting rid of the password field for users that don't have a password. Now how about cross-device? Scott mentioned this works cross-platform, cross-ecosystem. This was probably one of the biggest, this was the biggest um, design requirement as part of this effort. Um, so as part of this, we have this cross-device, cross-ecosystem FIDO authentication that the idea is that your mobile phone, the thing that you're carrying, the, you know, what we're more or less becoming your wallet, um, can bootstrap another device in a different ecosystem, right? So if we look at what that means, I first access a site, let's use Windows and Android just because that's the screenshot here. Um, I want to access a new site on Windows. Um, I don't have a passkey in the Windows of the Microsoft ecosystem yet, but I do have one on Android because that's where I started my experience. I can actually use that mo my phone, my Android phone, to securely sign in on Windows, and now the relying party can say, okay, now that you've signed in, go ahead and create a Windows passkey that will work from then on out. The last thing we want is users taking their phone out every time they want to sign in. It's a bootstrapping mechanism. If you've ever used services like GitHub, right, GitHub, the first time you sign in, you use a security key, and then you get prompted to enroll Windows Hello or the Apple Platform Authenticator. It's almost the exact same experience, except now you're using your phone instead of a security key. What about those high-value consumer and enterprise use cases, right? This is probably, what, second, it's two, number two in the list of questions we get. Um, what those use cases are, like regulated industries, financial, government, healthcare, um, politicians, journalists, executive influencers, who are typically in what would be considered consumer use cases, but they have high value accounts, right, the advanced protection programs. Um, and then you have kind of your traditional enterprise and privileged access. What do we do about those? That's where that DPK comes in. We think it's super critical for this initiative. So a quick visual of what that looks like. Hopefully it works. Sorry, the animations got jacked up. But um, it's a per relying party, device bound key, that is sent along with the passkey, right? So it's an addition to the passkey. So what would that look like for a relying party? If I am signing into login.example.com, my passkey in blue in this case in the top right, Tim at example.com is on all of my devices, laptop, tablet, phone, and I go to login.example.com, each of the platforms, if the relying party requests it, will actually mint a new device public key and package it together with the signature and send it off to the relying party. Now the relying party can decide to do nothing with that. 
we work, we, it's one of those things you shouldn't request it if you're not gonna do anything with it. We imagine people will use it if they request it, but the relying party can pump that into their risk engine, right? Many, yeah, many relying parties out there have a very advanced pipeline that happens on a sign-in, and you can do whatever you choose with that, right? You can simply use it to notify the user you're on a new device. You could do a, in a very advanced high security use case, you could prompt for a step up uh, via an app uh, on a, um, the first use of the key. Um, but the key is that, no pun intended, the key is that that will be the same key from then on out on that device, right, for that relying party. So, you know, in theory, if you keep seeing the same DPK every time, that's a trusted session, that's kind of the trusted device model. We're trying to bring back the trusted device model that kind of people had implemented with the single device credentials. We want to be able to offer a similar model with the multi-device credentials. So we think it's super important, especially in enterprise, um, but we do believe for banking and um, you know, a Twitter verified user is a great example, we do think it's gonna be super important for those use cases as well. So wrapping up, it, we believe pass keys are a drop-in replacement for passwords, right? Passwords, <laughs> pass keys cannot, are phishing resistant. No matter what you deploy today, with, if it's a password plus OTP, password plus magic link, password plus SMS, this is instantly better. I'm happy to have that debate after at the, at the thing. This is instantly better. I think anyone from Microsoft, Google, Apple, or Fido will say the same thing, right? This is instantly better. You can literally drop it in. Um, if you've implemented WebAuthn already, there's not a lot you need to do. A lot of the things we've shown are actually on the platform side. That whole cross-device flow, it's super technical and complicated. You don't have to worry about it, right, unless you're Microsoft, Google, or Apple, or a security key vendor, which I, is anyone, except for John? Is anyone in the room? No? So you don't have to worry about any of that, right? And that was the magic, right? We tried to create a magical experience for users that doesn't necessarily have a big impact on relying parties, unless you want to. If you want to implement DPK, you can. Cross-platform, cross-ecosystem, familiar UX, and co a, a contextual signal for higher security use cases with that DPK. So those are kind of the four main pillars. We think we, going back to our vision slide, we think we hit all of those. Um, if you were in Andrew's session, this is not an overnight thing, right? This is going to take time. Uh, platforms will slowly implement. We expect security key vendors to implement some of these features, which is awesome. This isn't restricted to platforms. That was just the focus area as those are the devices people have in their pocket today. And we had to throw in a Drake slide, right? No passwords, <laughs> use pass keys. And uh, we, Scott and I will be around. There is, um, Christian is in the room. Christian has a much more in-depth session with Andrew on Thursday at, do you know? Uh, 10.25. And Scott, you have a session, FIDO 101. Thursday morning. So there's more sessions. We'll be around the whole week if you have questions. Let's, let's debate some of this. We know it's a new hot topic, so uh, hopefully this was helpful. Like I said, this is a high level. Uh, and. We'll see you in some of the other sessions. Ooh, lights out.